Hello, and welcome to another episode of Just Keep Writing. A podcast for writers. By writers. To keep you writing. I'm Nick. I'm Shingai. I'm Samim. I'm Gabe. And I'm LP. We're back here with LP once again. LP? Yeah. Forever and ever. We're, t- we're still talking about uh, Matt Bell's Refuse to Be Done. Uh, this week, I'm super excited because the section is called uh, Feed Your Imagination. Uh, reading a slight excerpt from here. It's, it's separated into two parts, which are art life and uh, art life and live life. Uh, reading a little section from the book. Uh, imagination is, is not a static lump, but rather a malleable, if mysterious, entity made of two primary substances, art life and lived life. As you write, you put these twinned substances to work together, and with them, you forge something wholly new. During your first draft, you'll need to draw upon the art life, the art life experience you already have, while replenishing and enlarging your experiential stockpile whenever you find your supply of inspiration wearing down. So first part is the art life, right? So every novel I've written gradually accrued a project-specific foundation of other art. Novels and short stories, poems and plays and essays, movies and music and visual art, all of which somehow felt in conversation with the book I was writing. Often, this art foundation starts small, sometimes consisting of only a single example that serves as the model for the kind of book I'm writing. As time goes on, other art begins to stick to the project, to pile up, to suggest the larger conversation I'm entering. Finding your art foundation will help you see how your book already has its fellows in the world, ancestors and companions to help guide you on your way. There's inspiration in this and confidence and community in conversation. Everyone has a work in progress at the moment. Um, how do you address the the works that are ancestors and companions to your work? Are you a person who stops reading everything so that you can focus on telling the story that you're telling? Do you ingest stories that are in the same milieu to help you build the idea out? How do you approach this? What do you think of art life? I could start. And you what an also- interesting question. <laughs> that is yeah. such a good question. Damn it. Everyone is paralyzed <laughs> in fear to answer this. I, I, I've thought about this, so I'll give you all some time to think. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you also reframe the question as well? Reframe it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the, the idea is that our all of our work is in conversation um, with other works, right? Things that are written by our peers, as well as things that are written by our ancestors. Um, and what Matt Bell is suggesting is that uh, while he's writing, he finds works that are in the same sphere or milieu, whether that's on a prose or craft level or on a... Um, content level that are in the broader conversation. And he says that this helps him understand how the themes work in his own stories. Right. So I'm wondering if y'all also ingest other media in order to enliven your work, or if you're like blinders on, I can't look at anything else that is like mine because I'm afraid of being influenced. What, what are your thoughts? So I'm going to, I'm going to do a thing real quick for those listening, right? So I, I just learned about this in school. It's one of my favorite subjects. So this is called the metatextual conversation or being in conversation with, right? So what other books can you have a conversation with, with your own writing? I love this question because I, it depends on the subject for me. Um, science fiction all in. I can read other stuff to pull and let me be influenced by it and like pull in and research and like be like, hey, that's interesting. Let me go look into that more to see if I can pull that subject matter in, right? Um, one of my favorite books, Machine Hood by S.B. Divya, that is an incredible book with the metatextual conversation about artificial life and things like that. Really good. The other part of me, so when it comes to fantasy and any any type of contemporary fantasy, I can't, and I don't know why. Um, and I've I sometimes tend when I'm reading fantasy and contemporary fantasy, right? I tend to mimic the other authors' voices, and so I shy away from that. Science fiction, not an issue at all, 
but with the, this other stuff, I start mimicking their styles. And that's what I have a problem with and what I struggle with. So I don't, I don't do that with fantasy. Gabe, what are your thoughts? Um, no, I'm thinking of asking Nick if the biggest problem is that you mimic the style or that you're also mimicking the type of scene or the type of beat or plot point or like what is your issue when you do that in that genre? Um, I would say I mimic the voice, the author's distinct voice too much. Uh, specifically, like this is an issue with R.A. Salvatore. I cannot read R.A. Salvatore or Terry Brooks and write fantasy at the same time. It does not compute for me. I start putting their own voice into my work. What if you read all those books while writing a book? I, uh, you'd have Dritz fighting the elves over in Terry Brooks' world with the trolls. I mean, and maybe that's not the worst thing, right? Because then, like, isn't our own unique voice built off of, like, all our favorite authors' voices <laughs> to some degree? And no, that's true. Yeah, maybe there's something to that a little. I think that, I think there's power in uh, this makes me think about singing and how like you know part of learning to sing is to learn the song the way that it's sung and then it's learning the inflections to sing it exactly the way the person would sing it and then you can take it from that song and apply apply the way that they sing to a different song right mm -hmm. uh, but that also means you you learn how to how it's working and then learning how to turn it off like learning how and when to choose it. Um. Yeah, I don't necessarily think that's a bad I, bad thing, Nick. <laughs> you should try okay. using it sometime. No, that, that is super interesting because I'm like, I don't feel like it's mine anymore at that point. And that's like where I struggle is like, this isn't me. Although <sighs> the fight scenes that Salvatore does in his works with Drix, I, ver, not verbatim, but that's where I learned how to write fight scenes because he does them so well. Right. I feel like you could also go back and revise some of that stuff, right? If you're like, oh, this sounds too much like this other author. But if it helps you like from a yeah. generative perspective, I think that's that's cool with me. What are you thinking, Shinga? A little bit of like a diverting from that, but also drawing off of Nick's earlier point um, about sci-fi. I think that I actually realized during this conversation that a lot of my story ideas come from other books. <laughs> and usually it's not fiction, it's theory. Um, so that's something that's really useful for me when I'm thinking about like, cause I read some, you know, political theory um, and usually I have an idea that's stuck in my mind that I'm like, okay, that's, that feels like a story will come out of that. And um, it's very much in conversation with the work that I read, even though it doesn't directly say so. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, what I've noticed that, because I've had that happen or what Nick was saying of like copying the style, the voice of an author that I was listening to much or rereading or whatever. But I've noticed like the thing that I pull the most I mean, it's weird. It's like the courage to do things. Hmm. Like if I notice that a certain book is doing a certain theme in a way that I thought that was damn, like that, I would feel that I was doing too much, that I was going farther than I could. But then I see it happen and like, oh, damn, I, that can ha I can do that. Or I also like start to feel, for example, I'm re-listening for like the fourth time to Greenbone Saga. And then like I'm now primed to go more, I mean, this is not one of the main themes, but I, to go more violent, but also to focus way more on character relationships and uh, character voice. So like th those are the things that I, oh damn, like I might feel afraid to try those kinds of things or like reading Kaiju Preservation Society by Scalzi recently. I was like, oh damn, you can go full geek on the science and make it look sound so cool and make it work for the story like yeah i want to try this so that i think that's mostly what i've gotten 
what I get from being immersed in a story. And I, I don't shy, like I don't stop reading when I'm writing a short story or book or whatever. Shinga. I mean, exactly everything that Gabe has said all of that because it just reminded me that one of the biggest things that I, I teach in my writing classes with teenagers is like when you're reading close reading is about asking yourself what does this per- this writer give you permission to do um and yeah i think i i very much internalize that also in my own practice where some of my favorite books gave me permission to experiment in my own writing in ways that I didn't think that I could. Um, yeah. Which is, I guess where the idea that I was, I mentioned earlier comes from that we're always borrowing from our favorite authors in some way. It's a meme. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think I have a lot of things to say about this. So I was like trying to figure out what the right thing was. Um, I think like plus one to everything everyone's just said i think um i think i found with when i was writing short fiction more when i am writing short fiction more i can be a little bit more intentional about like wanting to read this author whose style i just i love and want to learn to emulate and not necessarily like the whole thing but just like is a specific emotional point in this story and i just need to figure out how they did that because it like had this impact on me and i I really want to understand that better Um, and i don't always consciously do this but i find after i've read a lot uh, months, years later, it, it does show up without really intending to. Um, but working on a novel, I found that I sort of have this trade-off um, where I can either um, read or write. Um, I can do audio stuff, like commute doing commutes and stuff like that, but I can't do audio for long fiction. I can do it for short fiction. So that sort of leaves me with like nonfiction and like short fiction influences while I'm writing. Um, and so maybe those have an influence, um, but I don't think I go into it with intention. Um, I think just consuming whatever is interesting me, me at the time uh, often does lead to some influence. There's some reason why I was interested in it. And there's because I was interested, there's something that I would like to emulate probably. So like I, I watched the show Beef a couple of weeks ago and like that definitely is having an influence on my like character development and writing and just the interpersonal relationships and stuff like that. Cause I was, I watched that and I was like, it's nothing to do with my story, but there was just some like stuff that I really loved about um, how they developed the characters and showcase the characters and transition from one character to another. Um, so I don't always go into consuming different media expecting to want to emulate it. Um, and then also like Shingai was saying like nonfiction, when I'm reading it will often sort of lead back. Like I read a book on attachment styles recently and I was like, that's definitely going to impact how my characters are relating to each other. Um, So yeah, I don't always go into these things expecting it, but it definitely happens. So how you, has anyone found like going back to editing or rereading a piece that you've written and you notice that, Oh, I might have been reading this kind of like this story. Like, I remember an author saying that they wrote a scene which they were reading a ton of Sherlock Holmes, but, and they went back and was like, okay, this is very much, like I, like he added the mystery element and the character dynamics, but didn't notice it while he was writing that. So just, I don't know if you have ever, like, noticed that in your own writing. I definitely have uh, written lines later on realizing that I wrote them because I want LeVar Burton. I want to hear LeVar Burton <laughs> read them out loud. So uh, I think if, I, if I'm listening to LeVar Burton reads a lot, it definitely um, impacts my like pacing and tone. <laughs> I don't think that's what Gay was asking, that, but that's, that's honestly, what Gay that is wonderful. That might be the <laughs> best thing I've heard all day, though. <laughs> it's nice flex. Yeah. I recently... I, I, Sorry, LP, go. Sorry, I, I wanted to respond to what Gabe was saying. Like, I think the key to that is like, or at least what I hope is the key to this, because I'm in, I'm in, <clears throat> I'm in the middle of reading for Pride Week or Pride Month, and uh, I think part of the key to that is to read multiple things while drafting, or at least that's what I'm foreseeing. Like, if I'm working on a novella and I pre- assume that it's going to take 
more than a month, I can read more than two novellas in that time. And then I'll have read some more novellas that are touchstone pieces for that at, while I'm letting it rest. And then I'll go and make a revision plan and be reading another thing. And by the time, while it's out of beta readers, I'll be reading something else that's still in that that lane uh, to like ingest in a lot of different ways. And then hopefully in that, that final edit, like put it together, ideally. That's cool. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm thinking of, I've had many conversations with writer friends about like, hey, I'm struggling, struggling with this. What can you recommend? Or if anyone in the group can recommend something that does a book or a story, whatever, that does that well. And then I think that's, I mean, that's part of the original question of LP of going, yeah, I mean, definitely go feed your imagination, but also like your skills. I think that's a key part of improving as a writer. Like you're struggling with the relationships. So someone recommends go read this book. And not that you pull like the exact like one-to-one -one from the book, but you go read as a writer. Like go consciously to read a thing, to learn something that will improve like directly and like quicker, not just internalizing the thing so that it becomes part of your like your toolbox, but going consciously like, hey, I'm going to learn this from this thing. So I think that also is super important, or at least that's that's what I felt. Yep. Yes, I, mean. I, I think that's where um, having access to like a writing group and community is really, really critical because I don't know what I haven't read, obviously, um, mm -hmm. but sharing it with other people and then having them say like, oh, you should read X, Y, Z thing. And that's not always going to be helpful, but I think often it, it's coming from like the right place and it, it really does you look at it and you're like, oh my God, this is what I was trying to do. Um, and now I understand what I need to do to, or what I need to change to actually break through or just to understand, like, um, we we're talking about earlier, like what is possible, um, and sort of break out of your box. For the novella I'm working on, <clears throat> I put together a list of things to consume. Uh, and, uh, some of it is film, some of it is television, but a few of them are books. And those are the ones I'm kind of excited about going back to. But like I watched Us by Jordan Peele. I'd already watched every episode of Love Island across all the franchises, uh, like Too Hot to Handle, Reading Stepford Wives, Several People Are Typing by Calvin Kasulke, and Mapping the Interior by Stephen Graham Jones. But like, I don't know. I'm going to get through those eventually. We'll get there. But like, are there any, are there any texts that you have handy while you're working on whichever project you're working on now? Um. I I go not usually text or like classes or whatever. I literally YouTube. Like certain channels that are really good at picking apart either media or a writing tool. Like I tend to have those handy that I know that there's a particular one. It's overly sarcastic productions. Like they go into a trope, a certain trope or hello future me. Yeah, exactly. Like those kinds of, And like, I'm going into a certain store, um, plot point or a beat or struggling with something. And I know that I can go to those quick videos to just jumpstart things, not even go learn, but, well, yeah, also learn, but going into things that you're listening to a writing tip and then your brain is putting in, putting it in your story. So that's, I feel it's more readily available to me than to go to, to a book. Sometimes that, that could work, but for me, it's yeah, basically YouTube. Shinga? Um, yeah, I'm resonating with so much of what Gabe is saying. And like, it also makes me think that to answer your earlier question, Gabe, about how have you gone to a story and realized that you were thinking about something or reading something during the time that influenced that, this actually happened to me recently. Um, when I was looking through old short stories where one of my, my, I think it was my first flash fiction piece to get published was a story where um, the words tomorrow and yesterday are banned. And like 
this society, there's no talking about the future and there's no talk, talking about the past. And I remembered that this was a moment in time where I had learned that memory and imagination share space in the brain. And then I'm always thinking about like anti-colonial um, ways of being in the world. And like that for me was like fucking wild, like just like what it is to mm -hmm. tell people not to remember their past and how that affects their inability to imagine a future. Um, and yeah, so it was this idea that was I was deeply fascinated with and like it just seeped into everything that I was writing, obviously, and like specifically that story. And even right now to answer LP's question, I'm what I'm obsessed with is the anti-capitalist revolution. So <laughs> I'm consuming lots of YouTube content on on what that looks like on like anti-imperial work. I'm I'm reading lots of books on revolution. Um and I know that that's going to seep into my work because it's the thing that I'm excited about learning. So I do think it comes back to like what you're excited about learning in that moment. Yeah, I love that. Just seeing everybody just nodding along, like, "Yep, yep." That's <laughs> all that. well, I, I think it's, I, I think it's super. I, I know, like, I restrain myself from like going down rabbit holes sometimes. Um, but I think what I've learned is it's okay to go down the rabbit holes um, and to obsess and, and go deep on things um, because you can you can revise out whatever you need to. But if it's making you excited, like. It's energy that you should tap into um, and enjoy it. Uh, going back to the book really quickly. <clears throat> the bigger you make your art life, the more possibilities your imagination can generate. I was a reader before I was a writer, and I would, if forced, choose reading over writing. I'm a writer because I was a reader who wanted to, there to be more books like the books I loved. Without a constant input of art, I stopped wanting to make my own. I think that's a pretty common experience. So keep yourself fed, keep your diet varied, keep putting enough art in so that art keeps flowing back out. Do you think that keeping a strong input helps keeping a strong output? Or at least in your practice? Definitely. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, like even something like, even listening to music and finding the right music to write to um, to put you in the right mood for whatever scene you're trying to write, like that is super, super critical for me. And then there'll be times where I'm like, I can't, I can't write this scene. I don't know what's going on. And then I realized I just have like the music I'm listening to is too mellow or it's too high energy or something like that. Um, and that, that causes like a complete shift just in the moment. Yeah. I'm, um, I mean, I've been writing almost for seven years, the book that I'm working on. Um, that's not a flex, obviously. Um, <laughs> but after so many times, I've noticed that the I have a certain correlation of my slowest times of writing or when I'm writing the least, obviously life and things, but I'm also reading the least, consuming things the least. I don't know if there's also a relationship between not being in a good place and also that makes me not read. That might be one of the connections, but also I felt a few times that just reading, consuming things, whatever, I mean, TV, movies, books, shorts, whatever, just has gotten me out of writing slumps because I get excited again about things. And going back to the to our previous conversation, it has gotten me excited to try things out in my going back to my book, like, holy shit, this kind of beat, this kind of character interaction, I would like to do that in my story. And then I go back and then I start producing more and then I'm excited to read more. And then it's like a virtuous cycle. But so, yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely. I think it's something, and sometimes I have needed to force myself to read and it's like born from a, like a negative emotion of like, oh, I should be reading more because I'm a writer and I should be learning more and expanding my, I mean, okay, that's, really. yeah, it's not, it's not like the best source to read, but I, just pushing through has helped me a 
ton in the past. I mean, responding to that, I, I've had to reframe that in order to get the shit out of it because I'm so resistant to everything. Uh, and I have to remind myself, look, I get to read this book in preparation for this. So I need, I get to read this for pride month or I, and I forget a lot. Uh, but like, I don't know, everyone didn't get a chance to, I have a copy of a, a friend's novella that they want me to blurb and I'm like, that's super cool. Like I get to read this book before anyone else gets to read this book. Or even if the book came out, like I get to read this book. Cause like this book is dope. This is exciting. And framing it that way has been helpful for me. Um, before we leave the art life conversation, I want to ask what the work in progress with your, with your, the, your current work in progress, what is a book that you would love people to not you use as a comp, a book that you'd like other people to be like, Oh, I read this book and I think it's totally in the same vein. I think this does similar things. Like I have a book idea that I want to work on that I was like, Oh, if people say that they get the fifth season from this, I'd be like, yeah, okay. That's what I was going for. Fucking love that. It's not the fifth season, but if people say that I was like, Oh yeah, fuck yeah. That's my shit. Are, are there any books that you're like, Oh, if someone said this was, if someone put this book next to my book, I'd be super excited. What, what books would those be for you? Damn. That's, that's a hard one. You've been working on your book for seven years. You should know by now. I got this one. So a cool, <laughs> A career I'd like to follow is actually Maurice Broaddus's. Mm-hmm. Um, I I mean, I love the man, mm-hmm. but I feel like he has a very interesting career. He's not just written books, but he's done short stories, television, games, movies, like the people he's connected with. Like there's a reason why his name keeps growing every year. If I could emulate his career, I'd be happy. Now, there's a few of his books like Night, Knights of Breton Court. I'd love to read an urban fantasy that can be compared to his and held up to his but uh, for me i gotta go with the the rangers apprentice series but oh i just put the book away last name's flanagan uh just because the current novel i'm working on is a common is a cross between that and the witcher on the darker side of ya so um it's YA, it's emotional, it's dark, but it's not your traditional emotions that people get to uncover. So John Flanagan, yes, thank you. Um, so that's kind of where like I'm at with it. Whereas if I can get compared to some of these longer standing fantasy series or be in conversation with them or urban fantasy series, I'd be very happy with that. Yeah, and I mean, going back to your comment, LP, about writing the book for seven years, the main thing I think is that it has changed so much. When I started out, I was joking. I was joking. No, no, no. But I think that, I mean, that brings up an interesting thing about like my career with big quotes, like about my process of writing this book. Because when I started out, one of the things that inspired me was like the, the structure for of the name of the wind of having the frame story. I love that. I love that book. I read it so many times, but I've also, I've changed as a person. I've, I now notice all the things that are so wrong in that story. So, so wrong that like, I, I, I mentioned this in the, one of the first episodes that we were together, about how I use that book to sleep because it distracts my brain enough that I'm engaged and whatever. I just, there's so many parts that I skip. And like back then I would have said, oh yeah, definitely King Killer Chronicles. I would like my book to be next to that. I still would like to, but for different reasons, for different things that I've learned, that I've taken from that story, the mystery element, um, the, the the structure itself, many things. But now, like, if I would have to choose just the one, it would be the Greenbone Saga, because, yeah, I've mentioned it many times. Fonda Lee just does incredible, extraordinary things with character and character relationships. Like, that's, and that's my jam. That's... That's what I, not even for the fantasy part, which is a fantastic secondary world. Like, I would like people to say, oh, damn, like, I'm invested in the characters of Gabe's book in the same way I'm invested in Fonda's. So that's, I think that's the core of the comparison that I would love to have at some point. And also, you've been working on your book for seven years. So, like, you as a person yep. have changed, you as a writer have changed. I don't think you wrote short fiction when you started your book. Nope. 
not to like yeah. the ways in which that project has grown. There's no way that <laughs> the 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 Touchstone books would be the same then as yeah. they are now. And lately, uh, like hearkening back to the previous conversation of what do you take from books that you like or that you consume, I've put in so many things now from Greenbone and many other things that I've read, but that have changed my story fundamentally, like from its core has changed from the things that I've read in these past seven years. Now it's closer to its final form, but yeah, I th and I'm so happy about it. Like I'm really happy where it's at and I wasn't there for the last few years. So, so yeah, I would love to be compared to, to be next to Fondly in the, on the shelves and in conversations. Yeah. So the S is now, who wants to go to first? I don't have an answer. No, I really don't know. Like I, I, I'm most curious to get it done and put it in front of other people and hear what they say in this regard. Um, because I, I honestly, I, I don't, I mean, I'm just like not well read enough, um, to, to like be able to grasp onto this, or I'm just too deep in it that I can't even think outside, um, far enough. Um, there are definitely authors that like, if, if people said it reminded me, it reminded them of, um, I'd be thrilled if anybody said the fifth season, I'd be super excited, obviously. Um, uh, but I don't know if I'm like, I can't think of anything that I'm in conversation with off the top of my head. Um, because I think I'm still just figuring out what the conversation is. Um, so it's hard to say. Do you think that is also part of like figuring out your own story? Like also being in the process of writing it. So, cause mostly we don't, at least I don't figure it out in a first draft. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. So. No, I, I think that's a huge part of it. I think it's also, I'm channeling a lot of, um, history and like religious philosophical, um, teachings that I'm not familiar with that. Like, I mm -hmm. feel like I need to go and study more. And I'm sort of trying to balance like writing the story versus like just getting stuck doing deep research. Um, and so I hope to come out of it knowing what work, um, it's in conversation with whether it's fiction or nonfiction or history or whatever. Um, but at this point, I'm just not sure. Nick. I do want to say in, in I want to put this up for argument I don't think you have to be in conversation with anything. I don't, uh, for me, I feel like being in conversation with another piece or subject, it is something that I do very intentionally. Um, for example, my current whip, it is all about the foster care system um, and my thoughts on it and lack of certain things, right? But it's set in a fantasy time, so like it works for me. But that was intentional, right? I didn't just write, oh, orphans would be cool. Like, this would be dope. So I do think it has to be, it is mainly to me intentional. And I don't think it's bad if you're not thinking about being in conversation with another work. Um, and I still think even though you're not doing it intentionally, you can still be in conversation at the end of the day for other people. It's me. I think that just made me um, sort of realize that um, at least to some extent I'm in conversation with like my, the community that I grew up in and came from. Um, and I think it's not necessary. There, there are probably works of fiction uh, as well, but I don't think that's what I'm necessarily speaking to directly. I, I think I'm speaking to my community and um, where the conversation I want to have with them more than anything else. What about you, Shinga? I, okay, well, one, one of the things that I'm really grateful for, a little flex, is that my book was put side by side with one of my favorite authors. Um, I've had folks talking about, and this is how to stay alive with the death of Vivek Oji by Akwe Akemetsi. And like when I was thinking about who would be the person that I would want, like I would be so excited to have my books be put side by side with it's them um but then also like for the novel that I've been working on like that's very different from their style because it's secondary world fantasy 
Um, and I think the ones that have awed me are like Black Sun. Yeah. And if anyone said that I like my book did as anything remotely as close to what Rebecca Roanhorse did with Black Sun, I would feel very honored. Um, yeah. The Poppy Wars a little and like She Who Became the Sun and the Unbroken trilogy. I really am just like queer fantasy. Like that's, <laughs> I think that's what it is. <laughs> like all of them. <laughs> uh, the only one you haven't uh, mentioned that I'm surprised you haven't mentioned is River Solomon. Oh yeah. Yeah. River Solomon got a whole shout out in my acknowledgements. <laughs> <laughs> This book is dedicated to you, fam. <laughs> like, right, I know you move. don't know me or care about me, but I love you. <laughs> okay, I have a finger doing a heart. I'm just waiting on you for the other side. Um, So I'm going to move uh, on from art life. I thought that was a really cool conversation uh, into lived life because this is something that I struggle with. <laughs> uh, so again, with uh, the section of the book being Feed Your Imagination. The other part of it is, is a lived life, which I think I was feeling triggered, so I didn't really highlight much here. But I'm going to read a little bit from the book. Um, the other source feeding your imagination is your lived life, the memories of your experiences up to this point and the emotions attached to those memories. Without doing any research, you bring a lot of this lived experience to the work. As Flannery O'Connor famously wrote, Anybody who has survived his childhood has enough information about life to last him the rest of his days. Assuming that you, too, have survived your childhood, by the time you start your novel, what else might you still need to add to your life to write your book? And how can you best access those experiences as you write? Damn, that's I, a huge one. Yeah. I, I think I, um, I re reflected on something like this recently where I realized when I was like in my 20s or early 20s, I was like, I would never have enough like to write I, like what would i write a memoir about and then when i got to mid, my mid 30s i was like i don't want any more material like i have enough um like enough has happened um so yeah i, I think that like i don't like writing myself or my life into my fiction but it shows up uh, often in ways that i don't i don't realize until like a few years later um so i think just like giving myself the freedom to let let the words flow um, and see what comes out and not like overly analyze them uh, and where they're coming from is always helpful. Uh, ways I neither expect nor want. Um. Um, I mean, this, this feels like a hard question and it, for me, it relates a bit to what I've mentioned of how much I've changed as a person, as a writer. And uh, like when I started out, the first time that I wanted to write a novel was when I was 18 years old. And I wrote ideas and it was all high fantasy, all the things that I consumed, all the Lord of the Rings, uh, Aragon, all the things that I loved, that I was all amazed by. But as I've progressed, even in, in the book and as a writer in general, it's just, and Will has mentioned this to me several times that he has felt that my writing has improved the more that I put myself in and not just like not just going by the things that i that amaze me or that that i like but being more vulnerable both in the things that i've lived and for like using that as fuel consciously and like he has like my friends have noticed that i've been doing like less consciously but at the same time more like with more intent of a, a short story i just wrote i have a lot of Spanish in it. And when I speak in Spanish, I use I use so many swear words that it might constitute like 30% of my vocabulary when I speak. And I leaned into that in, in the story. And I was so happy about it. And it just improved what I was doing because I was not like, I wasn't holding back. And also about my culture. Like in my main story, it was... When I started, my first ideas, it was all traditional fantasy. 
but now it's I have way more culture. A lot of my my culture, indigenous cultures of of Mexico, Mexican mar modern culture, like all those things. Now they're there, and I didn't before. So it's it's a weird balance of being vulnerable while writing things, but also like yeah. Oh damn! I'm sorry, my brain is just spiraling. In that Samim, please save me. <laughs> um, no, I, I want to. I love. I love. Th thank you for sharing that because I love that, um, and I I love that you said that because I went through a very similar experience where when I was trying to to write the concept and the idea, it was very flat. But when I sort of let myself show up on the page, um, things just like came to life. Uh, and I got the, I got exactly that feedback that like, Oh, this is, I hear your voice now. Like I see your voice in this. Uh, and it wasn't that like, Oh, this sounds like Samim or this is like clearly about your life or anything like that, but it was just clearly channeling something more. Um, and I think I've, I've heard this attitude and maybe this is a more old school thing, but I heard this attitude that like, uh, the author should be channeling the characters and they shouldn't be showing up on the page themselves. And I think that's like a terrible thing to say to an artist. Um, like I, I can't imagine anyone saying that to a painter um, or to a singer songwriter. Um, and I don't think it's any different here. Yeah. And uh, yes, that's, that's the reasoning I would give to LP. <laughs> White supremacy is what I typed in the chat box. Uh, just like the idea that like, we shouldn't show up in our work or that like, there's this weird thing where like in, 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 in polite society that we wouldn't, or in Western civilization, that we would be quiet and polite and that we wouldn't show up in our work and that, like, all of writing is, like, the nuts and bolts of grammar mm -hmm. and where the semicolon goes. But I think that when we when we forget that heart is such a huge... And it's not a huge part of all fiction, right? It's not a huge part of all poetry or nonfiction. Sometimes the experimentation, sometimes the, like, placing the semicolon in the right place is the art for people and I respect that. But like there's a lot of art that is about heart. And when you when you when you ignore that, when you skip that, I think um I think the work suffers and also that like you're ignoring in a lot of real ways the the thing that we as people who write can contribute to a work. Um I want to check in with Sheen Guy. She had her hand up first. You good or Oops. I was just going to say the, the white, just plus one, the white supremacy thing. Cause I've been told uh, that the South Asian references in my stories didn't add anything. Um, and so the, what you said about like wanting to sanitize uh, and focus on the nuts and bolts is like mm -hmm. exactly right. Sorry. Shanghai. Yeah, no, literally they want you to erase everything that makes you, you on the page, which is then the story is robotic. Like it's written by an AI. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> um, yeah, I fully agree. And in fact, I just, I want to plug LP because me as the teacher, I've, I've been teaching my students a word which I learned from a workshop that I took with LP that was called Fix It Jesus. And... <laughs> LP talked about writing your ontology and that's been like one of my biggest writing prompts that I've given students and it's been like so useful in them accessing the story because being able to understand who you are allows you to understand character in a way that feels true in a way that feels real <laughs> um yeah so I, I definitely think that you need you need yourself to be on the page for the story to feel true. And even if you're not, even if it's not you that's on the page, you have to know what you're bringing to your work to know what you don't want to bring to your work. You know, that that's to be a conscious decision. Um, yeah, even even if you showing up for your work isn't a constant con conscious decision there may come a time in the future where deciding not to show up in your work is a con conscious decision. And that intentionality, I think is really important. Um, yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, Nick, do you have an answer to the question? Oh, I mean, yes. And no. and I'm going to, as I'm pausing for time to read the question again, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dick. I, 
Well, I know, right? Uh, I just want to make sure I always answer the questions as you ask them, not how I interpret them. Yeah. I, I'm one of those people is one, I'll never tell someone not to put themselves in a book. Um, coming like I'm, I'm, I'm a white guy, right? Like there's been enough of that going on. Right. And I think, just because I don't understand something or feel something for that, that doesn't mean anyone else will feel the same. Right. Um, but I think, I mean, and this is a me thing. Like I have to bleed on the page. I've learned this the hard way because one time I had to write a story for school and I cried my ass out writing 3000 words because I had to bleed on the page just to tell the story because it was the story that needed to be told. Mm-hmm. Right. And I learned that from that point forward, it's like, I'll let myself bleed on the page. I don't care. I know the personal story behind it. And I can, you know, go through that myself. That doesn't mean I I need to tell other people the story behind that. So I'm one of the minds where, like, I think you do have to be bleed on the page. I think you have to be in your works inherently. I personally add certain traits of myself in my characters. Like, because I know that trait so well, I could, I should be able to write that trait. I know I have it, right? I know I have this weird thing that I do with my hands. Um, wow, LP, wow. Um, you know, when I talk. Um, but yeah, you. I think you got to put yourself on the page. Otherwise, I, I, I don't know. I From my experience, it comes out flat and you don't know the work as well as you should. All right, last question for tonight is have you ever considered or have you actually gone out and went out and picked up a skill, learned to do a thing in order to better infuse your characters with realism, your stories? Yeah. Yes. Did you learn to knit? Uh, I didn't learn to knit. I learned how to, um, I was in the middle of like a group writing, um, like meetup, uh, and we were doing like a warm up prompt, uh, and the story got kickstarted, uh, and it went in this direction where the character was learning to cook this Pakistani dessert, uh, and I got up 15 minutes into the meetup and I was like, "Sorry, I gotta go." Uh, like I went to like the Pakistani grocery store, called up my mom, got the recipe, and just spent the afternoon uh, learning how to cook this dessert. Uh, I didn't touch the story again for like six months after that. Um, but, uh, it, it definitely helped, um, help me better understand what the character was going to be doing. Mm. I don't know if that's what you're asking or if I misunderstood. No, no, that, I mean, I think that makes perfect sense. The idea that like, when I think of the craft sequence, the first book of the craft sequence is about lawyer wizards. You have to know something about the law in order to write that book. I would not have been able to write that book. I'm a, I still don't know anything after reading it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, do you do you just draw on the skill sets that you have, or do you go out and find new skill sets to add to it? I'm gonna go to 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 knife maker Gabe. Um. Well, I think this is related to the very often, um, like the tip of write what you know, like mm-hmm. because yeah, it it shows on the page. You can you can tell when a writer knows what they're talking about. Like that is a thing. I personally haven't gone out to learn something to like put it in fiction. Now I'm super curious. Like just find something, go learn it, and write a story from it. Like that. Now I'm excited to do that. But but yeah, I for example, I don't have a blacksmith character because there's so many of those in fantasy. But I think from the knife making, I've, yeah, it having something that you do with your hands to create something from nothing gives you a certain way to approach things. And as Nick was saying, like, I put that in bits and pieces in characters. I don't make a knife maker character, but I've put parts of my process in the character or a quirk that a character does while knitting or while whatever but it comes from just experiencing a thing and it just flows into the page it's not i don't know it's yeah it's the, the basis of that is just writing what you know 
but it's part of it. And right, what you know, it's not just of the things that you can do. It's also about your experiences. But so, yeah, Shingai. Um. Yeah, what you just said made me think about, um, also the aspect of like practicing the thing reminds you details that you forget when you're just writing it without actually doing it so i'm thinking about like what samim said about cooking or baking or whatever like if you're writing a scene about baking or cooking forgetting like the the little details that make it feel a lot more real you remember while you're doing it where you're like, oh shit, I forgot the baking powder or something. And that becomes part of the scene, right? And it feels more real because it feels more accurate. Or even um, there was an essay that I think, oh God, I hope I get their name right. Meg Ellison? Meg Ellison, yeah. Yes, Meg Ellison wrote about um, the body taking up space in stories. And and just like you can tell when a writer isn't like is completely missing the body, like taking up space because they're writing, oh, he said this, she said that, they said that, blah, 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 blah. And then they move there. And it's like, but there are details about like what it feels like to sit in the chair, about how your feet touch the ground or how the hug can feel kind of awkward, but like kind of nice and you don't know what to do with that weird feeling and you know the things of being alive (laughs) and the more that you do them and pay attention to yourself doing them the the truer it feels in the story as you're writing about them Um, i think i'm thinking also of finding beta readers for a certain thing for a certain expertise and like what i've noticed when writing is that when you go into rabbit holes, you're basically like scratching the surface of things, like learning the basics of a thing. So a very useful thing is to write something, put in brackets, um, flying a plane jargon. Like you have a character do this and then put it in brackets and try to find someone that knows how to fly a plane. And then, hey, could you help me do this? And I mean, I think that gives it like, a feel of realness to the general readership, but also if, if someone that does know how to fly a plane goes and read that and is like, oh shit, this person knows mm-hmm. what they're doing. Or they might not know how to fly a plane, but they did their homework. And I think that's that's very valuable. You don't have to do it for every single thing, but I think that's super useful to have to have that intention and to put that work into a thing to just make it better, make a better experience for a reader. What about you, Nikki? Um, I'm going to be the weird one. It's not skills I go and learn. It's senses. Uh, smelling different food, tasting different food, touching different things. Uh, I feel like skills, I feel like I could watch a YouTube video on and understand what goes into it and be taught that way, right? But it's like, I, get, I don't get to experience dragon fruit. Unless I go get a dragon fruit and eat a piece of dragon fruit and learn how to like cook with it, like kind of what Simuin did, right? So I'm mm-hmm. more of a sense guy than anything when I uh, try to do some research and like bring that into it and learn new things. Um, but I haven't had, I haven't written anything where I lacked a skill in or knowledge in that I couldn't write about yet, which may mean I need to challenge myself more. Or that you have a lot of skills, so you just don't need to. That's true. Remember the going from your twenties to thirties, and you're like, ah, stop with the life experience. <laughs> Is that what happens? Ah, uh, I guess. I mean, my twenties was spent in the military. I'm a train wreck. I've had cancer twice. I've got married into a family with three kids. I need some peace and quiet for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! Yeah, you really just got your life story in like three. <laughs> you did. <laughs> the Reader's Digest version, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa. I'm good. Like, are you? I mean, I'm. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm gonna keep doing stuff that requires life experience. I'm getting the experience points, you know. Now you can go do it in fiction. So live a peaceful life. 
go explore those things in fiction. More things. That's what, that's what Skyrim's for. <laughs> LP? Oh, yeah. I've never gone out and learned to do a thing. Um, I find that after I moved to Los Angeles, I I, I got super... Insular about what I was willing to take risks on. Moving to Los Angeles was the biggest leap of faith that I've ever made in my life. <laughs> and I think it's made me kind of risk averse uh, because moving here was so fucking hard. Um, and I'm trying to get out of that. Um, I have a lot of, I spend a lot of time on TikTok, the black part of TikTok, the black part of, of Twitter, the black part of Instagram. And like, there are a bunch of things that like black people like like I don't do that. <laughs> Swim, I don't do that. Get in the ocean, I don't do that. Skydive, I don't do that. And I'm trying to like undo all the things that like I think that I don't do so that I can try to figure out what I'd be interested in doing. Um before I moved here, I started knitting. I liked knitting. It it was one of the most like serene experiences, and I think it's something that I need to bring back to my life. I think it's meditative and like very cool. But I don't think I'm going to write any knitting fantasy. I say as the story pops into my head, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but like we got some time for the knitting fantasy, but like, yeah, I, I think that I might go out and start just doing things to do them. Like chucking axes or like shooting arrows or like, yeah. It's gotta be violent. It doesn't. I, I used to dance and found out that like I'm just too in my head about dance. In order, I'm 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 one of those people. My exes are into video games, and like I can't play two player video games with people because I get really competitive, and then I get mad at them and won't talk to them for several hours because they're better at it than I am. So like, I also have to manage the fact that I'm a fucking mess. Gabe, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, just I was just thinking that. I mean, the question, I think, in more often than not, it's like the other way around. Like, not going to learn a thing because you're writing about it, mm. but the things that you know end up coming up in the writing in different ways. And just, as you were saying, April, just LP, like, try, go do more things. Not to have them in your writing, but eventually they might inform it in some way, shape, or, or form. That's kind of what I meant. Like, if I if 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 I hadn't stopped myself from doing things, I might have more things to pull from. Um, yeah, and not because I was like, oh, I did this thing, so I could write about it. Just like I would just have more things in my having done them vocabulary. Uh, go ahead, Shinkai. Yeah, it kind of just reminds me of our earlier conversation about what inspires your writing. I think hobbies definitely inspire writing like anything that you're learning will make you excited to I think will make you excited to create if you have like a brain that is in any way similar to mine like when you are learning new shit you're thinking about how yeah you just want to know more about it and I think while you're creating you end up learning more about the thing or becoming more excited about doing the thing. And it's like this loop that feeds into each other, which is really cool. Um, yeah. And like, I'm in Vermont right now. So I've been learning my like outdoorsy survival in case of the end of the world skills. And it's so fun. <laughs> yeah. I haven't made it to that part of my black people don't do that thing. Cause I like was forced into it, <laughs> I, I I understand that, and look, I'm glad that you know how to chop your own firewood and like things like, of that nature. Um, because I'm glad that you're yeah, here. I'm no, glad that you're a house. I'm taking a carpentry class, so okay, I'm gonna be a house. You're giving mm -hmm. a lot of you're giving a lot of Jesus right now, and I love that for you. <laughs> If Jesus was back in it. prayer, ooh, maybe he was. I mean, the, no one's saying he wasn't. Anyway, yes and. LP, what are we talking about next? 
Oh, okay. So next time we come back, uh, we're going to be in a section of the book called, or we're going to jump around a couple sections of the book to try to consolidate. Uh, the next section is called Creating G- Generative Characters. I would love to talk about his concepts of keep characters acting as well as the stories characters tell themselves. Um, and then we're also going to go into, if we have time, we'll go, cause we only did <laughs> two sections today. Uh, we're going to go into discovering the right scenes, uh, which has a lot of really interesting, uh, ways of approaching scene craft, uh, as far as like structure of scenes, as well as turning like habitual action into specific action, um, or turning a single action into a series, like figuring out when it makes more sense or when it doesn't using lists to manage time. Counterpoint scenes, scenes that mirror from the beginning to the end. It was like, oh, well, this has changed since then. Look at my characters changed over time. That's so proud of them. All right. Stay tuned, stay alert, and get to reading. Get to writing. Both. Just keep writing. (laughs) I missed missed our tagline, didn't I? (laughs) And this has been Just Keep Writing, a podcast for writers, by writers, to keep you writing. You can find us at justkeepwriting.org. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Feel free to reach out to any of us on our social medias, and please jump in our Just Keep Writing Discord channel. Links to all of that is in the show notes. Lastly, please support our show by going to patreon.com slash justkeepwriting. We offer daily writing prompts, early access to podcast episodes, and much more. Thanks for listening, and just keep writing. (laughs) 